right. Are we there? We are. How you doing tonight? Oh, that's not right. There we go. Pushing buttons. Here we go. Cool. I don't like that one. Let's do that. No, let's do that. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. All right. Hello, chat. Welcome to the show. Our first time actually doing the podcast. Of course, we got together a couple days ago to the Q&A. We'll do those again. Um, but this one is the actual podcast-ish. Uh, a little bit different. Got a special guest I'll introduce here in a few moments. But otherwise, uh, if you're in a chat, just let us know where you're listening from. If you're in Europe, I apologize. It's really late for you, but I appreciate you staying up. Um, we'll lay out some ground rules going into this. Again, as we talked about last time um, in the, pre, the pre-podcast, I guess you could say. Uh, we are just kind of recording the conversation. We will pause for some questions. Um, super chats, absolutely, we'll get questions because you've done the super chat um, but otherwise, we're going to have conversation. So don't get pissed off in the comment section if you ask the question about what our guest's favorite color is or, you know, what he likes on his pizza. Um, and we don't get to it. Okay. So, because otherwise, we'd be here for a thousand years answering questions. Um, we will again do those QAs. Maybe we can get our guests to come back and do one of those where we just kind of focused on a little back and forth. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how tonight goes. But uh, I will introduce our guests. Uh, a good friend of mine, Matt Petranis. Uh, We've known each other for going on right at 20 years, 19 years, I want to say. Um, he was my troop commander when I was a warrant officer. And then uh, we've just stayed in touch over time. We had a, a very a, a bonding moment, I guess you could say, uh, which we'll talk about later in the show. Uh, but Matt, thanks for, uh, for taking the time. And, and, uh, I know it was a little dicey cause you what, saw a car accident. What happened? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me back on, I guess my performance on the first one was good enough to merit, uh, <laughs> merit getting invited back, which isn't normally what happens. So it's great to be here and, and good to see you. Um, and honestly, great that we're, you know, like I said, 20 years in and we're still, we're still doing stuff like this. Um, yeah, pretty spooky on the way home about two, three miles from home. So a car, uh, just kind of weave out. I guess the driver fell asleep or something. I mean, literally right through traffic, right into a big old telephone pole. And um, yeah, I mean, luckily, you know, e- you know, we got EMS there pretty quick and everything. But uh, um, yeah, uh, they were both okay, but pretty spooky. Seeing, I mean, probably hit a telephone pole on about fifty miles an hour. Is pretty pretty spooky. Yeah, yeah. I was afraid because you just sent me a picture. And you're just like, I might be late, and I just see a wrecked up <laughs> car, and I'm like, all right. I guess he's hurt. <laughs> he's on his way to the hospital. I just tried to add some suspense to the evening. That's all. You, know? you, you did, in fact, add some suspense. Uh, we were we were danger close to uh, to rescheduling, but uh, he, he braved the elements and got back uh, here for us. So I appreciate that. Um, all right. Well, I tell you what, what we'll do is just give a little bit of background. Uh, you referenced um, us having a uh, an interview situation before. So for people watching that was for authentic media which i have talked about uh in other places and here a little bit um that is a subscription service Uh, i'll make sure that the link goes down below you guys can check that out but what matt and i talked about in that interview was his experiences as a uh, a first-time deployer during the uh, invasion into iraq he was a lieutenant uh with uh the 82nd airborne division and just talk about his experiences there so i'm working on a series over on authentic media and you guys can check that out but we'll talk a little bit about matt and uh, a background uh you know his background so go ahead and just tell us a little bit about like where you're from where you went to school and how you got started up into aviation sure uh so we yeah, originally from new jersey uh, i'm the guy right uh grew up really up in the Northwest corner. So no, you know, no residual New York accent uh, closer to like New York state in <laughs> Pennsylvania. Um, our claim to fame though, for probably most folks that watch TV or whatever is uh, the main industry in our town was, was an amusement park called action park, which uh, since has I've been of this. documentaries. And I think Johnny Knoxville <laughs> did a movie. Uh, I think he kind of renamed it, but that, that was the, um, that was the actual antithesis of it. Uh, and it was this amusement park with this amazing idea of the, the people, the customers are completely in control of the rides. You're not strapped in, you're not anything. Right. And, um, <laughs> which, which gave homage to 
you know, being known as accident park and class action park and traction park and all that. Um, so, but great place to work is, in, you know, high school and college, you know, like they say, best job I ever had. Right. Um, this but, tells uh, me so much about you. Like everything well, that I've known about you is like <laughs> suddenly coalescing <laughs> numbers are flashing in my head. Oh yeah. That's yep. awesome. Yeah, formative, right? So, um, absolutely. Uh, I think I think it's still two or three of their rides, even though the park is closed and rebranded and everything. I think uh, it's still two of their rides. I think are still top ten most dangerous amusement parks like rides in the country right now. So, uh, go ahead and Google that once you're done watching the, the podcast. Wow. Yeah. So, so, where did you go to school? How did you to get into the army? Where Where did you go to school? Sure. Yeah, I did the I did the ROTC thing. So I went to, you know, did high school and probably like a lot of 18 year olds really had no clue really what I wanted to do. So uh, went into college and I was going to be I was a criminal justice major. So I was either going to be a cop or a lawyer or if that didn't work, but gym teacher or something. I don't know. And then uh, the, the ROTC thing just kind of clicked on me. I had some friends that did it and I don't know, just kind of clicked and um, enjoyed liking it, you know, re or really enjoyed it a lot, liked it. And then uh, next thing I know, I'm signing a scholarship, which I uh, frankly don't even remember signing. I was just like, oh, yeah, sure. OK, four years, whatever. <laughs> right. You know, and, you know, this is mid 90s. So it's like, oh, the army's shrinking. We're not going to war. And I was like, well, whatever. It will help me pay for school. And I just genuinely liked what we did. Right. And so it, it was and then learning the leadership and being around people. You know, you get a little older. That stuff's important. And uh, yeah. And then you go to assess, you know, your your senior year, you fill out your wish list and um the brilliant minds that worked all the different uh, recruitment took us on a helicopter ride one day. And I'm like, man, this, if, if I could do this, this would be awesome. And I, I have zero aviation background, me, my family and nothing. Literally. I think at that point in my life, I'd flown in a plane once kind of thing. So, um, but I thought it would be pretty, pretty badass, and ended up, you know, branching aviation at that point and, and just never looked back. You figured it couldn't be any more dangerous than action park. So, no. Uh, and the statistic, I think <laughs> on any given day, we would have three to like 5,000 people in the park. I mean, it wasn't huge, like a Disneyland or something, three to 5,000 people. And there were three security guards. So, you know, all at the time, you know, five foot, seven and a half, 140 pound Matt was, you know, one of the first responders to any number of whatever happening. Right. So, um, yeah, it taught me to think on my feet and, and, uh, and deal with chaos a lot. So maybe it was a natural fit. I don't know. I feel like this podcast has just changed the focus. Now we're just going to talk about Action Park. But all right, so aviation, you you, you picked that. You got your your nickel right or your 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 discovery flight in the army. What what did they put you on Blackhawk or something? Uh, so we did. There were Hueys actually back then to kind of date myself. Oh, yeah. Um, it, yeah. We were going to a field training exercise, and instead of jumping in a bunch of fifteen pack vans, they brought in a bunch of National Guard probably alpha model Hueys uh, and, and Chinooks, you know, to give us a ride. And I just like, oh, wow, this is a, this is a pretty good way to go. Maybe I'll try this out. Did you, now I know you and I went to school roughly the same time. Cause I remember we had a conversation about this forever mm -hmm. ago. You went, when did you go to what well, they used to call it? What advanced camp? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, Do you uh, remember what year that was? 97. Oh, that was 97. Yeah. Yeah. We went at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Cause yeah. I went 97. So I think they did like a Chinook ride there. Mm -hmm. Like there was like a mission where you like landed in a Chinook and then like ran into the woods and attacked some bunker or something like that. Right. That's what I remember. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So aviation, what, what interest you, when you went to flight school, what did you know what you wanted to fly or was it just kind of discovery learning, figuring out what was next? Oh, all discovery learning. I mean, my main goal was just graduating. Right. Um, and <laughs> just you know move on and and back then i mean it, you know historical context is kind of tough right but i mean this is this is you know i think when i gra i started it was late 2000 or i'm sorry 1998 and then i graduated you know middle of 1999 that's like i don't know three flight school versions ago or whatever but um and my thing was was it, and, and they weren't you know we weren't at war at that point right it was you're lucky if you got a bosnia rotation right kind of thing so <laughs> Um, it was just, you know, what would you do if you're fighting the Russians or the, you know, the whatever, right? The big fight. So I didn't really know. I was just more focused on just, you know, it, it became very evident really quickly that like this is not a branch that you could half ass it in, right? You need to be, you right. need to really be as best as you possibly can be. And, you know, especially being commission folks in aviation, you 
already sometimes go in at, in a uh, in a cultural sense. You go in a step behind, right? Because a lot of people are like, oh, officers don't fly that much. Warrants will take care of everything. And, and don't get me wrong, warrants are great, but if you're going to do it, you better do it right and do it from the front, right? So I just really focused on that. And then over time, just, uh, you know, maybe I was brainwashed or maybe I just realized, but the, the scout mission for me would just became the most fascinating kind of badass thing that there was, right? And, you know, back then, again, if you flew an Apache, you were an attack guy and that's what you did. There, It's not like now where they have the, I mean, I mean, yes, there were, cavalry units with apaches in them but they were still just straight attack guys right so it's it's not yeah. quite like it is now so uh for me to be the overweight underpowered scout that goes in and picks a fight with the bad guy like that just really appealed to me so i said right, i'm gonna i'm gonna go for kiowas did you want uh the 82nd or is that just where you ended up just where we ended up at that point okay. yeah that's uh i think they had I think like seven or eight slots. So, I mean, it was, and there were like, you know, 20 of us in the class or something like that. So it was, you know, it's pretty, pretty, pretty. And all the Kiowa guys went to brag. I mean, it was one of those things where it was oh, really? all of you, boop, you're going there. So or for the most part, you know, so there wasn't a whole lot of choice yeah. in, in that. Okay. So what I wanted to, to ask you about too, because and I, I think we touched on this when we talked for the other interview, um, leadership, in aviation and you've and you've kind of touched on it here as well because army aviation is so different than all the others because we've got the warrant officers and we've got the commission officers and like you said yeah there's a very a very real divide sometimes between those two um and it's sometimes exacerbated by one side or the other on how they treat you know and how they sort of recognize uh the other's role to play in that mm -hmm. i think for commission officers it's very easy to to put yourself on the back foot because you you get hung up doing all the other stuff you got to make it a priority to be a pilot you know that's the the thing about the warrant officer you know which i loved being was just i i just come in and fly for the most part i mean there's other things you know people people get hung up on the warrant officers just fly part but they also forget the part where you're also the fridge bitch you're also the the mbg guy you're the supply guy like there's a whole bunch of there's a bunch of other not fun things that you end up doing uh when you're a warrant officer as well but for commission officers, it's very easy to get sucked into the primary job, which you should. I mean, that's your that's your job. Um, but you got to make it a priority to fly. I was thinking about, too, in ROTC, and I'm sure West Point's the same way. You sort of have this, like, mentality that you're going to be a platoon leader for, like, nine years. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, that's all they talk about. It's just, like, right. the focus. And then you get out into the forest, particularly in aviation, and you're a platoon leader for not a lot of time. I mean, how long did you spend as a platoon leader in aviation? Um, I mean, I got a pretty decent fair shake. I think I got like 20, oh. 22 months or something like that, but you know, not to, to kind of date myself, but, and, but you're absolutely right. You know, there, there was this thing of like, you better make the most of your platoon leader time and all this stuff. And then I got there. And for those of you that weren't Kiowa folks or not kind of know of the aircraft, there were two different versions of the Kiowa warrior back then there was the I model, which was the quote unquote mm -hmm. improved model. Um, which came out in like the mid early nineties. And then there was the R model, which had to do with the new engine and fuel control and everything they put into it. So when I got there, my unit was an I model unit. So I progressed like three days after I progressed, we heard we were getting R models and we stopped flying. So, um, you know, here I am in my platoon leader time. Like I just, you know, did my RL progression. I'm now I can fly with anybody. And um, we went through probably the six month thing where, you know, we were turning in aircraft and, you know, which, you know, everybody knows about now. So now it was, you went from, you know, being in the aircraft and learning from the warrants and doing your stuff to like, okay, you're the Lieutenant that's going to shadow the brigade infantry S2 for the next six weeks, you know, to professionally develop yourself. Right. Which was like a fate worse than yeah. death back then, you know? So um, I would have rather just been the fridge bitch, you know, at that point. Right. right. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it went quick, but I mean, it was, uh, but it, it it went really quick. Absolutely. It, it, even if you're there for like two years, it goes by just like that. Yeah. And I want to say guys now they're, they're nowhere getting near 22 months. I mean, you're lucky if you get like the full 12 months, uh, you know, and, and some guys don't even get to go to a line platoon necessarily. They may end up in a support type role or, you know, maintenance or something like that. Um, but so when we talk about command and that's really what I wanted to kind of get to is, you know, you were, 
the troop commander of Bravo Troop uh, 117 Cav when we deployed to Iraq in 2006-2007. There it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, what you were... I was going to say, we reflagged. You were in command when we reflagged. So it was Bravo 182. Yep. Uh, there it is. Yep, that's what made me think about it. And yep. then we became 117, which was an interesting time because I came from a Cav background as an armor guy. But it was funny to watch some of these dudes who were like, you know, the attack mindset of Kiowa attack, which was weird. Right. Um, you know, the <laughs> dudes who just like t- talk the biggest game about, oh, I'm not wearing a cowboy hat and all this stuff. And then, you know, they were the same dudes who would like wear it all the time. You know, they yeah. just totally embraced the the culture. Um, but at any rate, so I want to get to, so you commanded for a decent amount of time. I mean, you had a full two years, I want to say, in the job as a troop commander. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not I mean, you years. took command. You took command. I want to say probably three months, four months, if that, after I got there out of flight school, because um, yeah, it was yeah, I was only there for a little bit because uh, I can't even remember who was in, in front of you. It was Robin something. I can't even remember her last name. Uh, Robin Brown. Yeah, Brown. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, what was different, or what did you expect when we deployed, and the versus reality, like like. What was in your head going into combat, commanding all these dudes that you had already spent quite a bit of time with, mm-hmm. and then that you actually deployed? What was different about it? Well, just kind of talk about your experiences with that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I would say, you know, for the first for the first bit of it, it there wasn't much different, right? I think one of the things that I really tried to, for better or worse, or whatever people thought, I mean, I don't really care, but... I really tried to put in like the the culture and camaraderie with the group, right? Because I had already had a, I already had a couple of deployments under my belt before, and I knew that especially we were going twelve, you know, full twelve months. They were still toying around with like you could just get extended to fifteen, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, we knew we were going to we were going to Mosul and Talafar, and obviously Talafar didn't have much going on, but Mosul was the Wild West. Um, that, you know, we might be have guys going down to Balad. There's a lot going there. This is during the surge. So I kind of knew we were going to expect some shit to go down. So I really just tried to make sure that, you know, the camaraderie was there. Everybody kind of knew they can trust one another. You know, as a single commander, I didn't have someone running the FRG. I had, you know, a couple of the, a couple of um, our guys, wives helped out. And we kind of just did a, you know, a group thing. And the, and the goal was, I just wanted to make sure, you know, there was people there for the family who left anyway. When we first got there, it wasn't, you know, everybody still was teamwork and, you know, we'll be, we'll be positive and all that. And this is probably no different than a lot of units. But I would say probably three, four months into the 12 months is when you started to see, you know, personalities come out that I didn't see <laughs> coming out. Right. Um, obviously, we had, you know, a lot of events happen, you know, in September. That's when Matt Mattingly had gotten killed. Right. Um, you know, a week after one of the other guys got shot in the back of the helmet. I mean, you know, it was real. Things were really going on there. And so kind of having experienced that before, I mean, not not to that extent, but I kind of knew that, okay, I got to, you know, do what I can to keep the troop together, right? Because there's a lot of stuff going on here. But you could start to see in some cases where self-preservation started coming out and, um, you know, some folks that you would count on, you weren't really counting on that much anymore. And then to be honest with you, there was, there was stuff, you know, people coming out of their shell and rising to it, right. That not that I ever think they wouldn't do it, but it's just kind of like, wow, I didn't, I didn't really see that coming. You know what I mean? Um, and you know, the other part that I didn't see coming was we were attached to another brigade. When we went, we didn't go with the 82nd cab. We went with another brigade. And we were, I mean, frankly, just the bastard children of that brigade, right? I, I'm not trying to speak bad about them, but it was just, they, you know, we were the one cav squadron attached to them. They had a full up cab otherwise. And so um, going up north and doing all that work and doing all that dangerous missions and doing everything we did. I mean, you you knew the op tempo, man. It was nuts up there. Um, yeah. And, uh, but not, it, it, you know, it's kind of like losing kind of that higher I don't know what you want to call it, that support, whatever that, you know, we had had before doing other things. Right. So little things like that. And I think it was just because I don't mean to speak bad of anybody like that, but I think it's just everybody got into their interests at that point. Right. And, uh, sure. and I think, you know, the brigade was focused further down South and we were for, focused up North and things like that. So stuff like that, I, I didn't, I wasn't expecting, I didn't see that coming, you know? Yeah. I think at the time, 
it was sort of considered like Northern Iraq wasn't the big show. I mean, it it, it had kind of gone through different phases, right? And at the time, it wasn't necessarily. I mean, it was bad, but it wasn't as bad as like Baghdad, of course, and that's where all the focus was. But you know, you talk about the camaraderie. I mean. I tell this to people and I've heard it from other people who are in the troop and even just the squadron itself from those days, like the camaraderie during that time period has never been matched. I've never been in an organization where I felt the, the kinship that I did with the other people. Um, and I've never honestly observed it in any other unit. Cause you know, you get, you get higher up in the ranks, you're disconnected from everyone and nobody wants to talk, you know, normal when you walk in the room, but you can still see stuff. And I never really saw the sort of camaraderie that we had. I mean, it, Bravo Troop was wild. Like, mm-hmm. it was just wild. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, the parties that we would have at your oh, yeah. house. Yeah, I'm glad, um, I'm glad your kid's hair grew back, by the way. That was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's like turning 18, and I still can picture him like... I don't know what he was doing, but he's leaning on a keg. He's like two, and he's leaning on a keg like he's about to pass out. I don't think he was drinking. Mm. um yeah then there was the firework explosion that that (laughs) i just watched people banging in the glass doors trying to get away from well i mean we had these wild events um but the the troop was very tight and i think to the challenge that we had and it i never really thought about this way till now when we went to iraq we all scattered because not just did the squadron scatter right because charlie went down to spiker i think right yeah charlie troop is a spiker Alpha was in Talafar, we were in Missoula, and then there was the little kabuki dance later. But um, but not only did the squadron scatter, but the troop scattered, right? Because we were doing 24-hour ops. There's mm-hmm. only so many of us. And so, I mean, there were literally times you wouldn't even see dudes, right. you know, for a couple of days. And then if you did, you passed them, you know, on your way to the shower or to the chow or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, that's going to wear on on a unit over time. Um but I, but then I too, I wonder if our camaraderie wasn't as high as it was going into that. How much sooner would things mm-hmm. evolve uh, once you get over there? So yeah, potentially, right? And, and and you know that's another thing I didn't see that I, I think probably a lot of folks have saw is you know you're right. If you go two three weeks without seeing someone, you know all of a sudden then it starts to be like, well, I heard something happen last night. Well, I don't know really what happened, but. I don't know, you know, it, it, it very quickly, and we all lived in what a space, you know, 300 meters in a circle, you know, like, yeah, it, it's not yeah. like, you know, we were separated by ge- geographic, but schedules and you're right, you, you finish flying, you, you, I mean, midnight chow always, who doesn't love a little chicken cordon blue, but I mean, you know, right. maybe the gym, go to sleep, wake up and you're right back at it. Right. So very quickly, um, the, the camaraderie can get really stressed. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and you get into your routines. The one routine I could never get into is this sliding hour thing that we did. Really? Okay. I I did not like it, but that's just because I'm I'm slow to adjust. Mm-hmm. I know most people did, and it was fine. But oh, mm-hmm. uh, so for people listening or watching, what what we talked about was we would have a twelve hour duty day, but you would start the next day an hour later. And so the idea was that you were sort of like cheating the clock. And what was good about it is it would drag you into nights. And so there was never an issue of currency because if you didn't fly nights for what, 60 days, you would be on current. So it would drag you back in nights. But if you're slow like me, you just could not like every day was a little bit like longer and I just couldn't get to sleep on time. And so it took me a couple of weeks before I could finally get used to it. But, um, but it wasn't interesting. I've never seen that done before or since. <laughs> I've never heard of it. Yeah. And when I tell people about it, they don't, I'm like explaining to them, you know, weird math, but yeah, it was different. It was unique. Um, the other thing I guess that was unique with our setup in Missoula, which was awesome, by the way. I mean, like you said, we, we all lived in that very small section um, with those chews, we had the little shower thing, and then we had our little, our little CP. But then we had sort of a headquarters element sliced off from the squadron, and they would sort of manage us, if if anyone could manage Bravo Troop, uh, at least tell us what we're supposed to do, and then we go out and just just fly around. But you talked about the op tempo. I mean, talk about like a normal day in the life of what we were doing back in 2006 in Missoula. Yeah, I mean, it was it was just wash, rinse, repeat, right kind of thing. Um, because the the joke was every day's Tuesday, 
right? Because, you know, if it was Monday, it'd be Monday. If it's Wednesday, it's hump day, you know, but Tuesday, because it, everything just blurred together. So, yeah, effectively, the way our schedule worked is, is we had uh, 10 aircraft and, and 10 air crews organic to the troop, right? So we could we could literally go launch all 10 aircraft if we needed to, right? And then that headquarters section that Brian talked about had had additional staff aviators in it, right? That uh, their primary job was staff, but then secondary, they could fly. And very quickly on these op tempos, you could realize you, you needed to know, like people needed those staff guys. Uh, the first 30, 60 days there, none of the line guys, line guys, meaning the folks in the troops, would ever want to give up their seat. They never wanted to take a day off, whatever. But then by like month four, they, you know, you couldn't wait to give up two days a week or something like that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, effectively we had uh, with, so back then we, you know, everything was teams of two, right? So you'd always take off with two aircraft. Very rarely would you do two, three or four um, and you'd never do anything really tactically with one, maybe a test flight, but, but that's it. So you, we had four shifts that would cover eight hours a piece. I think it was either eight or 10 hours. And because you have to have overlap, right. To cover for 24 hours. So, you know, one would start at midnight, one would start at eight, one would start at four and the other, you know, kind of thing like that. And then we had another, um, we had another team or is it one or two teams? I can't remember that supported the SF guys. Right. And they were just yeah. on their own schedule. They just did their own thing. And you rotated through that. And just about every two weeks you would rotate a team. That's, for some reason, just the way we did it, it's the way everybody did it, right? Hence that we tried the experiment with that one hour ahead thing, like like Brian talked about. Um, but yeah, you'd come in, you would, you'd, you know, like let's say you're on the 08 brief, right? You'd come in, you'd be, but 08 meant that you were ready to go, you're ready to fly, right? So really you're coming in at probably like 536. You might grab some breakfast, you might not. You'd get your mission brief, you go pre-flight, you check the maintenance, you do your run-ups, you know, because back then, you know, you could, I mean, back then stuff was happening all the time. So we would do, we would do basically run-ups on the aircraft just to make sure everything worked, everything was set, yeah. and then turn it back down. And that way, when you started again, it was quicker, right? Because you could do what was called a through flight. Um, but I mean, a skilled crew after a while could be off the ground in probably three and a half, four minutes if they needed to be. So after a while, they got pretty good with that. But yeah, you'd fly, especially during the beginning parts, you'd fly all the time. I mean, it would be nothing to fly between four to eight hours every day. I mean, that's that's what you did. You'd land, you'd do your debrief, and you were kind of done for the day unless you had other things. But, you know, you got to remember, like, you're getting in the cockpit. At, let's say you're getting in at 745, and it's already 110 degrees, you know. And, <laughs> just, I mean, just sweating. Your, your frozen water bottle is now half frozen and melted, right? Um, and... Some days, you know what they say, stress, right? It's either the the a whole lot of activity or a whole little activity. And that's really what it was. I mean, some days it was like the Wild West with VBIDs blowing up and shoot, you know, infantry guys getting shoot at and all that. And other days there would be weeks on end where there's just nothing going on and you're just waiting for that next thing to pop off, you know? So um, do that for 12 months. Yeah, I mean you learn a lot of lessons about the environment. I remember just teaching guys who were brand new when I was flying Apaches and, and we went over to Iraq and I said, you know, don't leave your helmet like this because, because it's going to bake in the sun and mm -hmm. you're going to get a QRF launch. You're going to put it on and you're going to regret life because you're just put the, <laughs> these hot muffins on your ears. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. And the thing too, with Missoula is like, you know, cause we were in that bowl, right? So you had all this kind of like high ground around. This wasn't terribly high. But, you know, was this high enough where dudes could see what was going on? Because it wasn't uncommon for us to fly around for like six hours. Nothing mm -hmm. going on. Land. The moment you take off your helmet, you hear, <laughs> you know, you start getting mortared. You're like, mother, <laughs> put everything back on and take off. Yeah. You knew they were just waiting for you to, to basically shut down because they could keep track of us. And all we did was operate in the city. I mean, we just took off from yeah. Diamondback and just basically flew around the city. Mm -hmm. Unless we wanted to go look at the mosque or or the or the uh, like, what was that, the monastery, yeah, yeah, the monastery off to the east where they made beer or something like that, whatever. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. I went out there too a couple of years ago. My last deployment, we were in um, Erbil and we'd fly over to Missoula and just kind of like that was part of our little area. And uh, I'd be like, "Hey, let's go this way. <laughs> like, yeah. Look over here, check this out." Like, "Oh, that's awesome." Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it was um, it was a lot of, like you said. It, it, some days it was wild and then other days it was just boring as hell and nothing was going on. But, um, and I, I mean, we got mortared, what, 
almost almost daily it seemed like all, I mean, all it the wasn't time. that frequently but yeah i mean it was enough it was several times a week yeah um yeah, even was- sniper shooting at us i don't know if i i don't i think you were probably behind me but it was um i know it was boots and i were taken off we were lead so i'm assuming you and cody were behind us and somebody shot at us but we didn't realize somebody right. was shooting at us. We just saw the asphalt kick up in front right. of us, like as we're like running across the runway, and we both like looked at it as we flew by. <laughs> it was like, yeah. what is wrong with the asphalt? What just happened here, here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't understand. Something's mm-hmm. wrong with this runway. Yeah, and then we realized, wait, someone's probably shooting at us. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, <laughs> a wild, a wild place. And there were, I mean, there um, were more times where you'd come back in pre-flight and be like, oh. The- Tail booms full of holes. Didn't even know yeah. that was happening. You know, I mean, just luckily they're bad shots, yeah. but you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I guess that leads us to what we can talk about there, you know, as I titled it in our little notes, that time we got shot up. Mm-hmm. Um, so Christmas Day, 2006, um, we got engaged uh, pretty heavily. And I was thinking about it, you know, you and I never really talked about it. Like we'd, I think we talked about it sort of in passing, you know, just like little moments, but we never actually like shared notes, I guess you could say sure. about yeah. it. And granted yeah. it was a long time ago, mm-hmm. but I thought it'd be interesting to kind of just go down that because the older I get, I realize my memory isn't what I thought it was. Right. Um, and so things, things change over time. And of course I was doped up for most of that day anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, Before we took off. Yeah. <laughs> well you weren't supposed to say it, but yeah yeah uh but yeah so let's talk about that because I'm, I'm interested to hear your side of things um beyond what i remember you telling me but again i think i think honestly i think the only time we really talked about it i was still laying in the hospital bed so mm. i was definitely on drugs yeah, i remember that yeah um yeah so you probably were green and had like horns or something like in my memory you know just like because I, I was so doped up but so that day we went on a morning flight what do you remember like leading up to us taking off? So yeah, Christmas day, you know, the, the general sentiment of at that time was, Hey, it's Christmas. We're going to kind of keep operations to a minimum in the winter time. You know, the fighting was a little bit less, I mean, not crazy, but you know, typically when it got colder, there were, there were kind of fair weather fighters. Right. So um, it had been kind of quiet and it was Christmas and, you know, like we do, we try to say, okay, on Christmas day, let's try to give folks, you know, you know, let's not t- make them as stressful as it possibly can for them. Right. Let's try to give folks a break. Excuse me. So, you know, we went out and at the time we had basically during our windows of flight, we had different areas that, uh, the Intel folks or the operational folks would tell us, Hey, go take a look here. We heard this, maybe, you know, last night there were mortars from here, maybe go check it out, you know, all sorts of stuff. So, um, and I just remember very specifically, we, we were just like, okay, we're going to go up, you know, it had been pretty quiet the last I don't know, week or so, two weeks, something like that. We said, okay, we'll go up. And it was daytime. It was broad daylight. I think it was morning time frame, probably yeah. eight, nine, 10 o'clock, something like that, if I remember correctly. And we said, okay, we'll go up and we'll do a, a, a an hour, right. We'll just go up and, and hit the areas it had been pretty quiet. And so, yeah, we did a team brief. We said, we're going to go up. We're going to check out a few of the areas. Um, I remember we went up, we did kind of a counter clock or clockwise loop around the city. If I remember correctly. Um, I don't think we tried to hit stair step with the, with the smoke grenade, but, uh, but um, <laughs> it wasn't at night. So it wasn't a challenge. Right. So that uh, we got to remember to tell that story. Cause yeah. that one, I forgot. About that. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. We'll get yeah. to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. One. Um, but uh, yeah, quiet. I mean, quiet on the radios, because really, when you would go up, the, the first thing you do is you check in with the, the ground forces, right? And see if they needed any help. See what's going on. Uh, because sometimes even just flying around, you know, you, you can check out the high ground for them. You can, you know, you're making noise, which tends to scare bad guys away, stuff like that. And I, I don't even think they were out. Like, I mean, it was literally kind of a ghost town. So no, they weren't. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just remember going out. We, we did that lap. We hit the north end of the city. We started working our way back. And uh, I remember, I, I do remember very specifically about this. I mean, we couldn't have been more than 20 minutes into the flight, maybe. Um, and I remember there was a section off to the northeast side of the city that it was it was very recognizable from the air, I think maybe because of the topography or something. But 
had been an absolute like that that was where all the fighting was happening i remember that i mean we had been in multiple engagements in that area before the infantry guys had been engagements in that area before all that kind of stuff and so we said okay hey we're not we're not going to go in there not that we think anything's going to happen but i just remember very specific because i was flying right seat at the time and i remember i, I kind of looked across was like okay that's over there um and i don't know if i got too close to it or if they had moved or whatever but i mean i remember looking back being like okay we're gonna fly over there now and then i just that's just when i remember like literally the entire helicopter erupting like literally just yeah. erupting um and like the smell of gunpowder and like you know all the all the dust and dirt and everything flying through the cockpit and i mean just everything you know in you know a second's time so i mean that that's yeah. pretty much leading up to it i mean it was it happened just that fast you know yeah i i remember that morning um it was relatively early. I want to say we took off probably about nine, if I had to guess. Um, but I remember I, it's funny because you, you as the boss, right? You're the commander and you were dealing with Major Cheeks, who was the detachment OIC or whatever we're calling them. You know, you guys had your conversations and us warrant officers had our own conversation. I remember us being very surprised when we sat down for the brief and we started getting briefed on things to go look at. Like, oh, we want you to look at the Senate. Because in our mind, it was like, well, it's a no roll day. Like, it's mm-hmm. Christmas. Like, the ground forces, like you said, are not out patrolling. If we go out, why are, why are we out type thing? Mm-hmm. And I remember I remember Major Cheek saying, well, you know, we got to provide presence or, or something like that. I'm like, okay. And it was weird because I remember Cody and I going out to the aircraft. We all did our pre-flights and stuff. And he just... I don't remember which one of us said it, but we both were like looking at each other. And one of us was like, I just don't feel good about today. And it's weird. Like there's a few things and we'll, we'll talk about another one here in a minute. There's this few things where you look back at it in retrospect and you're like, Oh, that's like a foreshadowing moment. But at the right, time, yeah. you know, it's, it's nothing. Yeah. It is what it is. Um, but we both were like, well, this is, I don't know, just something feels wrong about today. And then what's funny is we had talked for months, I guess at this point about taking a team photo. We'd yeah. never taken a team photo. Yep. And finally that day, I think you were like, we're doing it today. Like we yeah. need to take this team photo. Jake, can you, can you pull that up if you're there? Yeah, I got you. So we took this probably within 30 minutes of us uh, taking off. Oh, not that one. There we go. So, so we took this that morning. So we got, we got uh, Aaron on the left. We got Cody. We got you. And we got me on the right. Um, so I thought that was very interesting <laughs> in retrospect. And I'm glad that we did it because otherwise, right. yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, otherwise we'd never really got to. Um, mm-hmm. Cody looking absolutely magnificent with his mustache. Always spectacular. Uh, just, just the Tom Selleck that he is, and then me off to the right with with a mustache, but not quite as as glorious. Hey, and pencil, with thin that, pencil thin works, you know, ready to get after its scowl. That's true. Right. But um, <laughs> I, I wish that we had taken it in front of our aircraft because that would have been even more, yeah, more interesting and more fitting. Apropos, um, yeah. Okay, Jake, you can take that down. Um, so, so we took that photo, good, good timing, and then we took off. And like you said, yeah, I remember taking off heading kind of northwest, uh, it's not like Red Trailer Road area and stuff. And so, in my head being the lazy bastard that i am it's like i just want to hang out outside the city like they said they want us up for an hour okay cool we can do an hour let's just loop around the city and i think i'm the one that suggested to you like well why don't we go down to palestine which was yeah all the way around if you were to fly around the city like all the way down by the airfield and and that had been a rough neighborhood and then over our time there i think it got better i think throwing candy at kids helped i don't know right but um but I had suggested it. And in my head, for whatever reason, I thought you would kind of just like go all the way around and you just started like blazing <laughs> through. And I was like, all right. Cause I remember flying past the Uday and Kuse uh, mm-hmm. palaces or whatever. And so we blew through that. And then the same, just like you said, I remember us kind of cutting through and you didn't get close to that area. And you know, the area you're talking about, you know, that's, you know, unfortunately where Matt Mattingly was killed. That's where, we like three weeks prior had gotten to a big gunfight for like four hours. Um, in fact, that was the first time I ever laid eyes on a no shit. That's a bad guy. I remember mm-hmm. that dude, yeah. you know, army camouflage jacket with an AK in his hand. And I'm like, we're flying right over him and I'm looking at him 
And I'm like, that dude's got an AK. And then I hear, kak, 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 you know, and it was even on your GoPro and you had that GoPro <laughs> set up and that helmet cam or whatever, and mm-hmm. you could hear it. Um, so that was a bad neighborhood, but yeah, the same thing you did where I remember looking at that area and there was that hill. Do you remember that like weird yeah. hill? I don't know what the hell it was doing in the middle of the city. Yeah. Um, and it's still there cause I saw it a few years ago. Um, I remember seeing that and we flew on the right side of it, which is good. That's we're far away. But I still remember thinking in my head at the time, I was like, I don't want to be over here. Like in my mind, we were closer than than we were. But I was like, how do I tell him who's my boss that I don't want to be here? (laughs) And I remember literally looking out the left door at the mosque, right, which we can tell the funny story about the mosque Mm -hmm. later as well um, with the man pad. (laughs) <laughs> um, and so I'm looking at the mosque and I'm thinking, how do I delicately say to him, let's get the fuck out of here. And as I'm turning my head, that's when, just as you described, and we were low. I mean, we were, you know, standard Kiowa shit. We were hundred feet, you know, whatever. And the world just opened up. And I think about the times that we've all been shot at multiple times at this point, and, and since then. You know, it's always like a rat-a-tat-tat if you hear anything. Because a lot of times, yeah, you come back, there's some holes in the aircraft. You're like, oh, well, no shit. When did that happen? This was like being on the gunning, like on a range. Yeah. You know, it was loud. And like you said, we could, I could, I, yeah, I remember that gunpowder. I remember there just being like shit in the cockpit. Yeah, like, like, I don't even know why. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like, this yeah. trash. You yeah. know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and for me, immediate, almost immediately, it probably was immediately, but your mind changes, right? When, oh, when, totally. when in trauma. Um, but it seemed like a few seconds into it where I was hit, um, which I remember. This is one thing that you and I talked about, because I remember saying something like I screamed like a little girl and you were like, no, nah, you sounded like you stubbed your toe or something. <laughs> I don't know if you were just saying that to make me feel better, but I don't know. But what do you remember from like, OK, so like you said, the gunfire started like what then? Yeah. I mean, first thing is after it kind of, you know, it, it went away as fast as it came. Right. I mean, it was just like this blast of, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, I'm going to say three to five seconds. I don't know. Maybe it was longer or shorter, but that's just kind of what I felt like. And uh, I just remember the whole, I mean, a whole aircraft shake. And I mean, at that point, just the initial, uh, so I'll tell you what kicked in Dave Wilson and Forrest Sims kicked in um, is -hmm. what they did because both of them, were instructor pilots. Uh, Dave was was a sacred cow back then in uh, in 117 and, and 182. Great, one of the greatest instructor pilots I ever flew with. Um, he had been involved, like, and you know, he had had a long career and had accidents and had stuff shot at him, and just as every army aviator does. And he taught you during our old progression: fly the aircraft, no matter what, fly the aircraft, right? And then, um, so that was ingrained in my head. And then I don't know if you remember, this was back. This was a f- maybe six eight months before we deployed. Forrest and Candace were doing um, FADEC work out in McCall and they, yeah. and they, Frank, they crashed. Right. <laughs> and I remember we rolled up to the scene. And for those of you that know anything about Fort Bragg, McCall is about, an, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half drive from the airfield. Right. So if you, if you couldn't get a ride, you, you just heard one of your aircraft crashed, your crew might be banged up and like, you got to wait an hour to get there kind of thing. But I, we went out there, they were fine. But, but I remember them saying one of the reasons that helped them, basically they ended up, were able to get to the runway to kind of grease it on was fly the aircraft. When you think the aircraft won't fly anymore, keep flying the aircraft. And when you really don't think it'll fly anymore, keep flying the aircraft. Don't give up on it. So I just remember at yeah. that point, all the caution warnings were going off inside the the cockpit. So, I mean, the headset's blazing, right? Ears are still ringing. I'm kind of looking out of one eye because all the gunpowder and dust and stuff's in my, you know, kind of thing, even though I was properly wearing my visor for all the safety officers out there. Uh, but uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, but uh, yeah. And I just remember, okay, flight, like, is this thing flying? Like, you know, and I just remember just acting everything off, just hitting the acknowledge and just shutting everything up. Um, and it was very quick. It was, okay, is the aircraft flying? Yes, it is. Okay. And then I remember asking if you were okay. And you were at the time you were like, you know, we were both kind of flustered and I think you basically got it like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good kind of thing. And then I went back to the aircraft to look at, you know, all the chiclets and see, okay, is, you know, are we losing rotor? Are we losing oil pressure? You know, all that. And it was, you know, you can fault the Kyle all you want. That thing. I mean, Brian, you were the, you were the tag ops guy. That thing took, I don't even know how many bullets rounds 
rotor system, engine, fuel cell, everything. It kept flying. That thing like kept flying right through it. Yeah, we I've actually got some pictures. We'll pull it up here in a second, Jake. So just get ready. But um yeah. I I remember getting hit and for me it was this weird like I hate to make this sound like I'm not trying to blow it out of proportion or make it sound like like fancy. For me it was like an out of body experience and I think that's just your brain like saying, "Nope, you don't want to be here for this." type uh-huh. type just for a moment because I swear to god I remember getting hit almost immediately just bang 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 oh my god there's something happening ouch that hurts and i feel like i was behind the aircraft like literally looking down from behind as if i was a ghost or some shit and and i think it was just my mind just being like nope you know just for a second like get get away from this okay cool and then just kind of zipping back in and i remember the aircraft pitching forward pretty drastically at least it seemed like at the time again we're very low so it doesn't take much to like okay the ground is coming very fast and of course the gunning the you know the 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 sound came from the right side and you were sitting on my right so my first thought was you're dead like that immediately i was like he's dead because if they hit me they had to have hit him Mm. we're pitching forward dramatically and so my arm still worked at the time i didn't start seizing up yet i reached for the controls um just like you said yeah fly the aircraft Pretty quickly, I could immediately tell that you were, you know, in control. And, and it's funny because we're describing all this stuff as if it took really long time. We're talking about like three seconds, you know, yeah, like all exactly. of this shit just happened uh, so fast, and your mind just slows down. That things just happen at, a, at a, mm-hmm. an increased pace. Um, so I knew that you were in control, and then I got scared because I thought, okay, cool, he's in control, but I still feel like we're going down, and no one's around right now. Right. And that's what I was like. That's the really like the nervous part. It was like, we're going to survive this crash so that we can end up on Al Jazeera or something, mm-hmm. you know, like that's that's what I was terrified of. But, you know, you were in control and you, and you were essentially diving to to get more speed and, mm-hmm. and to, you know, evade fire and get away. But I mean, we just and we're gone. And I do remember saying something like I'm hit, get us out of here or something like that. And then, yeah, you checked on me. And so now we're flying away. And you're trying to call them. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and just like you said, it, it, it goes quick. So it was like, okay, something really awful just happened. Fly the aircraft. Check on Brian. Aircraft's still flying. And oh, by the way, in my head, I'm kind of like wiggling my feet and like, you know, like, you know, kind of, you know, just whatever, right? Adrenaline's pumping. But then the next thing was, was like, okay, whatever we just went through, hopefully trail, the, you know, our trail aircraft didn't go. Th- hopefully it didn't. So... Yeah. Um, you know, normally every kind of every ounce of your scout pilot says, okay, we're going to get away. We're going to turn around and then we're going to come back and shoot whoever shot at us. Like that's, that's step one, two, three. That's what we're going to do. Um, and I just, I remember the aircraft was kind of beat up. Um, we were still kind of unsure what we were doing. So step next step was, you know, link up with the sister aircraft trail aircraft. Let's get our shit together and then let's go back in and like, let's go lay waste to this stuff. And I remember trying to call him, trying to call him, trying to call him, couldn't get him, couldn't get him. I think we switched radios a couple times, couldn't get him. And so now, I don't know, it seemed like the two of us had like the moment of clarity at the, at like the same time that like, shit, like what if they got right. shot down, right? So now yeah. now we got to like, and so um, if I remember correctly, we, we kind of made a, a wide sweeping turn to yeah. visually look. We saw him, but basically they got hit really bad too. Luckily, I don't, I don't think they're, their cockpit got hit. I don't think they, those guys got hit, but like the rotors got shot up and like their avionics got shot. Yeah. If I remember correctly. Yeah, we, and well, I'll tell you what, Jake, why don't you pull up the photos? Cause it'll, all right, it's coming. Of that. <clears throat> you got it. There yeah. Go. All right. So that was the aircraft one, one, five. And I think by the count, because because Bo did the 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 tack op stuff. Obviously, I was not up for it, but uh, I think the count was between thirteen and fifteen rounds. So to put that into context, most of our aircraft when they came back had four or five rounds hit. In fact, before this one, the one I remember was balls four, mm-hmm. and I think they had nine nine rounds hit, maybe ten, mm-hmm. and that was a big number. I remember that. In fact, I think that's the one you referred to where. Um, Jim McDonough, I think. Jim McDonough, 
got mm -hmm. sh shot in the back of the the helmet which i think was the day after matt mattingly was killed and so it was like yeah. we were all like what the hell is going yeah. on yep. um so for us this was a ton of and also if you'll remember most aircraft back then came back with holes like you said in the tail boom these were all forward half of the aircraft so this is inside go back jake um this is inside kind of the back side mm -hmm. of of where the rotor pops out so you're looking at one of the pitch change links there uh with the rotor off to the right um okay go to the next one so there's actual like swash plate bullet mm -hmm. hole uh go ahead go next so that's in front of me that's that that big holster thing that we had for our m4 so our m4s okay. would slide up into that holster uh and that's just blown out there go to the next one so this one's interesting um cuz that's what you were holding. Yeah. And you got it I mean you got a little scratch didn't you? You got a little you got a little boo-boo. Yeah, it's it's like I say I can't say I <laughs> survived the wars without a scratch. Um but I mean literally <laughs> literally that's what it was. Like I remember somebody started writing the purple heart paperwork and I was like stop 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 like <laughs> just stop it, right? Um it, it literally yeah, so basically, you know, for any Kiowa pilots watching this, there were two ways that you held the collective. There was the right way and the wrong way. And then there was the way that everybody held it. Um, and so the, <laughs> the, the right way is if you, you kind of see up near the control head there, there looks like kind of like a, it's like a grip, right? And that's your throttle. And the way you're supposed to fly is you would have your left hand holding that throttle the whole time. And that's what you would, you know, pull up and down on the collective with. And the idea was that if you had to use the throttle for an emergency procedure or something like that, your hand was already on it, right? Um, the other way was how most people flew is imagine just kind of flat palming over the top of the control head. And a lot of, a lot of ways, that's how a lot of folks threw. At the time, that's how I was flying. So really, my, my arm was running down the collective. And where you see that bullet hole coming up, my arm was just kind of to the right of that, right? So... I think like one of the pieces of metal came up and like scratched my arm, right? But had I have been holding it the normal way where my hand was wrapped around that, that my forearm would have been closer to the bottom of it. And probably, I mean, you know, would have probably had a similar wound like yours, you know what I mean? Or come in through yeah. the forearm. Yeah, or worse. Yeah. Because yeah. because it all went through there. In fact, if you look, if you draw a line straight down from that hole, you see another hole in your seat. So that bullet yep. went straight up under your ass. Yep. Uh, yeah, and of course the collective was, wasn't laying down like that. It was up uh, right. when it went through. And in fact, I remember the rotor spiking pretty hard, the mat or the mass torque spiking pretty hard mm -hmm. when we got shot up. And as I think about it, it's probably because a fucking bullet went through the collective, right. right. <laughs> and, and pushed it up, I, you know, yeah. it, it, or me like just scared shitless, you know what I mean? Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Because one of the things, too, and I guess the credit really to Dave Wilson, like you said, is is muscle memory. Here I am, very clearly shot, very clearly thinking the aircraft's going to crash. The, I think the first thing I did after I realized you were in, still in control is I went to the page. I don't even remember what page it is anymore to check the mass torque. Right. Because that's what you always <laughs> did when you, because you're like, well, I hope we didn't over torque. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> it could be 180. I don't give a shit. Yeah, like, is this exactly. still flying? Um, but I'm going to check and make sure that we don't have to do any write ups. Right. Um, but that's just the muscle memory takes over because that's what you do. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, but yeah, so interesting enough that you weren't holding it at the throttle mm -hmm. grip and lucky. Because, yep. yeah, I think it would have gone through, like, your wrist or something. Probably, yeah. I mean, I mean shit, I, you could have lost your hand. Yeah, so you know? yeah, don't, don't tell the folks at Amcom, but I still have that collective. Um, and every <laughs> every once in a while, like, because that, that aircraft went back in a box, right? They just packed it up and right. shipped it back. Who never who knows whatever happened with it. But I was like, guys, the collective's not going with it. And the crew chiefs went and yanked it out for me. Because um, <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's coming with me. And every once in a while, I'll put my hand on it and be like, yeah. Good thing I was holding it the yeah. wrong way. I mean, it's it's crazy to think that way, but yeah. Yeah. So this is back behind you, quite a ways behind you, but the, we got the big black boxes. That was all the avionics and stuff. I think this is why we couldn't talk to Trail, if I remember correctly, Probably. because yeah. that was our radio. Mm -hmm. Um, because we were talking to them on an FM radio. Of course, at, at the time we had four or eight radios in the aircraft. We had two FM, a UHF, and a VHF. We had the FM. One of the FMs talking to them, another FM tuned up for whatever ground unit we were at. 
um, which I could not get a word in edgewise with those guys. Cause I do remember trying to call them to tell them that we had just been shot up and they were having like some sort of bullshit meeting or something right. on the radio. And I just yeah. gave up. I was like, all right, it's a change or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I, I remember distinctly alpha company needed MREs. <laughs> I do remember that. Cause I was just like, I'm bleeding out here and you're talking about MREs on the, yeah. and I was death. I'll tell you what, for the rest of my career, I was death on people using the command net for logistics. I was like, you have an ANL net. That's what that shit's for. Because when Johnny's out there getting blown up, he is not waiting to hear you talk about MRE. So that was one of the things I was drilled into people when I was teaching. But but that radio, as I recall, this was the radio. I could be completely wrong. I'm sure someone will at me if I am. Um, But they called us. So yeah, you said, and I remember this because it was like, it was hard for me. It was very conflicting because yes, of course we have to go look for them. The other part of me was like, God, I just want to go home. Like, I don't know how bad I'm hurt. I just know it hurts like hell. Cause I remember you turning to me and you're just, and I remember like the tone of your voice. You're like, we got to go back. And I was like, and I, I didn't say nothing, but in my mind, I was like, Oh, I really don't want to go back. <laughs> and you started turning left. And I remember grabbing, like, you know, we didn't have doors on um me grabbing the the frame of the aircraft and kind of pulling myself mm-hmm. as much as i could to turn around and look behind me and yeah they were just like right up behind us yep. tucked in and i was like oh thank god you know i was like okay yeah they're there and then they called us on the vhf because we were all listening to vhf on tower that was just the right, power yeah. frequency yep. for missoula and they called and they were like hey we just took fire and you were like yeah no shit so, so the, <laughs> and i remember coat you must have said something i think you said something like yeah no shit so did we brian's hit because i remember cody telling me later that he thought what you meant was i was i was dead um just because of you know the the history of people getting shot at that point on that deployment yeah you know matt was the only one at that time and and he unfortunately uh uh deceased so yeah so i remember cody telling me that he was like in his head he's like he thought you know i was dead and i think at some point i said something on the radio and then they were like okay cool all right cool so we so we started that left turn looking back. We saw them, and then that's when you started that right turn south mm-hmm. and circled around the city back to Missoula, which is only, or the the Diamondback, which is only about a five minute flight, if that right. you know something like that. Um, what do you remember? Anything going on with that? I I do remember. You know, there was still. I can't remember if we had a team conversation about it or not about like you know going back and trying to engage them whatever, but. I, I don't remember if we did or not, but I do remember once we saw that we visually saw him, started talking to him, you know, at the time and, you know, as the AMC, I was like, okay, look, I got one guy that's hit the aircraft are shot up. That's not, ne- I mean, like, okay, if this was really, really bad where we had ground guys maybe getting shot at or, you know, something like that. Right. Okay. We'll go in and we'll see what we can do. But I just remember at that point being like two, two banged up aircraft, got a guy shot, um, there's yeah. no ground forces out whatsoever to help us. You know what I mean? So even if we went in and laid the perfect rocket shots in and then crashed 200 feet away, cause the engine gave out, right. There's, you know, cause you're right. I mean, that was part of our, remember that was part of our pre-mission briefs about how to not, you know, die on Al Jazeera. You know what I mean? Like, you know, right. you know so, um, I just, I just remember, I think we all made a very quick call, um, we're heading back and at that point yeah just i mean literally i just hauled ass at that point i knew the aircraft was was you know was a goner anyway so i just i pulled in as much torque as i could and you know just made sure those guys could keep up um and then yeah i just remember coming in doing a doing a really long like having to haul ass because i think the adrenaline was wearing off and you were telling me like how bad your arm hurt and the other part that was messed up is you know this is december we're flying with no doors on and we had those puffy (laughs) winter jackets on right and so yeah. i just remember looking down and like both like your right arm and my left arm had blood all over it and we didn't know whose it was and we were like you know because the, 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 the adrenaline and everything's going so as it was dying off i remember you telling me your arm was really hurting and luckily we had the cash there right that um you know was you're able to you could go right in but i just remember you yeah, had doing a big long approach kind of skidded it in because i didn't know if that thing was going to quit or not and then <laughs> and the, the the really good medics and doctors, man, they did their thing, man. They were out there. EMS was out there and, you know, they did their job. Yeah. yeah so here's just an x-ray, you know, of me. And you can see there's some some stuff at the elbow and stuff in the the uh, upper arm. Um, OK, Jake, you can you can take take it back to whatever. Um, 
Yeah, I remember the blood thing because <laughs> you were flying back, and I remember you just like holding your arm up, and you were, just, and it was like so matter of fact the way you said it. You're like, "Is that your blood or mine?" <laughs> and I was like, "I don't know." And and I remember you telling me, and maybe I misremember, but I remember you telling me that when you you started to get scared for me is when I told you I couldn't feel my arm anymore, like it was getting cold. Right. And essentially, what's happening when, when you have trauma like that is you know, your body starts to, to seal off that area, right? So all the arteries and veins start to close up because it's, it's basically making a natural tourniquet. And and people have asked me, well, why didn't you put a tourniquet on? One, you don't think clearly necessarily in those situations because that was shock. Like, mm-hmm. we were not in a gunfight. Like, we were straight up ambushed. Like, everything, we were fat, dumb, and happy, and then suddenly chaos happens. Like, that's a very different environment than mm-hmm. when you're in a gunfight and you know stuff is happening and then you get hit. I think it's just very different the way it affects your, you know, your psyche. Sure. Um, but two, like you said, it was cold as shit that day. We're wearing heavy jackets. I remember I had that, um, that brown under garment type thing. Yeah. I had the heavy ass jacket. Like you can't put a tourniquet on that anyway. Yeah. It would have never really worked. Yeah. Um, but we were close enough to the airfield that we were going to get there fast. I remember like cursing you under my breath at one point about you asked me to turn the site off. Yeah, as we were getting close, and you were like, "Hey, go ahead and turn off the site." And I'm just like, "What the? F- why? Like, who cares?" But you told me. I don't know if you do. You remember why you told me to do that? Yeah, it was just to take. It was a stupid, simple thing. You know, it was part of the pre-landing check, right? That you know, you turn the, the MMS off, and I just remember your just your. I was generally concerned about your arm because, like, again, sure. we had kind of done these rudimentary training things because in the Kiowa, I mean, literally, like me and Brian, like our, our like it was not uncommon for you to come out with like the other guy's patch on your Velcro. Cause you were just, you know, like squished up against each other. And so we had done these kind of drills where like you would, you would, you would grab maybe not a tourniquet, but you would grab your pressure dressing that was kind of prepped and you'd, you'd squash it and push your arm, you know, anything you could do to kind of control bleeding, but there was no clear anything going on. Right. Just because, you know, again, puffy stuff. And it's like, we'll, we'll be there soon. But when you, I was really starting to get concerned, you said you couldn't feel anymore. So I just told you to do the pre-landing check just to give you something to think about. Like, that's all right. it was, you know, I, you know, site, yeah. whatever, no big deal, but it was just <laughs> something, even if it only for 10 seconds, you know, whatever, but apparently yeah. your rage took over, over your pain and that worked too. So you're welcome even to this day. <laughs> well, my rifle was called righteous indignation. If that's I remember right. correctly, which you guys know. um, But yeah, so I remember that. And then I remember us getting back to Missoula. We're like, and we kind of did like this midfield entry um, and came down and you basically, you just kind of raced along the runway because the cash, the the combat surgical hospital was down at the end of the runway. And I remember as we crossed the, the, the berm or the wire or whatever, Cody called and was like, Hey, I think you guys are on fire. (laughs) I don't know if you remember that, but I I was like, I kind of remember. Yeah. Well, essentially what happens, because we took, I think, five rounds in the fuel cell. And so mm-hmm. it was, and it's, as I tell people, it stops becoming a self-sealing fuel cell at three rounds. Because, you know, because yeah. the thing was like leaking like a sieve. I remember getting out of the aircraft and just, just fuel was just pouring out. Yeah, of the absolutely. And yep. so what I think was happening, though, is, is as we were cruising along, fuel is leaking out. It's then vaporizing in the air. So it looks like a cloud. Yeah. And so he, he thought we were on fire or something. Because I remember just looking down at the instruments. And seeing that we were over the runway, and I was like, I don't give a shit. Like, we're good. Like, we're going to land, and I'm going to get out of this, and this nightmare is going to end. Yeah. So you go cruising down the end of the runway. I do remember the crew chiefs talking to us later because, of course, they don't know what's going on. They just see 258s that normally land, taxi into the parking area, mm-hmm. blow, haul an ass 90 knots down the runway. And I can't remember who it was who said something like it looked like stuff was falling off the aircraft. It looked like parts were falling off. Like, you know, it's probably just one of those like in the mine things or something, but, but they could tell something was off. So you go skidding down into the cache. I do remember that. And right next to the cache, that's where the medevac Blackhawks were, Mm -hmm. as I recall. I think so. Yeah. And so no one knew, cause I don't think, I mean, I guess you called tower and told them what was going on. I don't even remember that. Honestly, did you call tower? Yeah, we told we called Tower, Tower uh, declared emergency, and then Cody and and uh, and Boots called back to the talk to let them know. So um, okay. they, there were folks there. I mean, I I remember it wasn't a complete surprise. Like when we landed, um, I, I remember like the fire trucks weren't there waiting. I think they were maybe right. a little bit behind, but the cash folks were there. I remember like like they were fairly pretty much right there when we landed, kind of thing. Or, or maybe that was just in my mind, but. 
Yeah, I think they showed up very soon after, and I because I remember the first person that showed up was one of the medevac crew chiefs. Yes, had run over, and I don't know why. You know, maybe just the the strangeness of what was going on. But I remember he ran over. You had done like an emergency shutdown, so the blades were still spinning, but they were slowing down. I couldn't get out of the aircraft because I just, I couldn't like op- my hand at this or my arm at this point just didn't work. Um, and of course I'm still just in like a panic at this point. I just want to get out of the aircraft because my biggest fear at this point was losing my arm. Right. Like, I don't know what it was just one of those things where it's like, I do not want to lose my arm. Um, we used to strap our M4s to ourselves. Some of us did. I don't know if you did, but I know I did that day. My M4, we had those like, um, elastic sort of like straps mm-hmm. and so the m4 because you didn't want to drop your m4 out the door right yep. um and so we had them kind of dummy corded to us essentially and i couldn't get it off and i just remember just being so frustrated and i look at this guy and he's like standing right outside of the uh the rotor disc as it's slowing down he's just kind of looking at us and i just remember like you like yelling like get me out of this thing mm-hmm. and so he runs over and i remember helping me unstrap and i think that's right about when they showed up and then with the stretcher, and then I laid down on a stretcher, and I remember getting peeled away. And I remember the first thing I asked the doctor was, am I going to lose my arm? And I swear to God, he said, no, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. And that made me feel so much better. I think about it now. He didn't know shit. Like, he probably right. just said that just to, like, calm me down, you know? <laughs> but in real yeah. life, he's like, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, lottery, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so they wheel me back, and then I think, I guess, I, at that point, I guess Cody lands next to you guys, and you guys came mm-hmm. in. Because I know I know you came in pretty qu- quick after. They were still, like, ripping all my stuff off mm-hmm. when you guys were there. Oh, sure. Yeah. What, what, I mean, what, I don't. I mean, I don't know anything about what happened from your guys standpoint at that at that point yeah it, so i mean pretty much we shut the aircraft down really quick um and we were probably we were probably a, a minute or two behind you right because you know once once they kind of had you and went in we're like okay he's in better hands than he than he was in five minutes ago or five seconds ago so <laughs> we just made sure everything was shut down i went over to to talk to to cody and, and aaron real quick just to make sure they were okay and then at that point all three of us just went in right to check in and i i vaguely kind of remember how the the er was laid out i remember they had you in the thing mm-hmm. and they're working on your arm um and uh they, they were you know obviously we're all like how's it going and i remember at that point uh colonel pyatt came who's our squadron commander at the time right some other folks had come in um because they heard what was going on and so it wasn't more than probably maybe like five minutes, maybe it's 10 minutes. I don't know. But basically one of the doctors or nurses had come over and said, Hey, he's got a couple, he's got some, you know, bullet wounds slash shrapnel wound in his arm. That's it. Because I mean, again, who know, like maybe you took one in the leg and you didn't know because your arm hurt more or whatever. So they basically yeah. said that. So everybody was kind of like, okay, everybody kind of calmed down a little bit. And then um, they did a quick check on me. Like they were like, you, like you have to get looked at. Okay, fine. And there wasn't anything. So, we just hung out until um, it, there was a wait time. I think they went in. I don't. I can't remember that. I know they. I, I don't know if they put you in surgery or if they just kind of pick stuff out as they went. I don't know how that went for you. Um, but then the next thing I really remember is is meeting you kind of after they had treated you and you're kind of in recovery. I guess you know what I mean. But, and yeah, that, that's really the next thing I remember. Yeah, I I recall you guys coming in because they were they were laying me on the stretcher and moving me around trying to get all my stuff off you know they're cutting all my uniform off and everything and (laughs) they did the rectal thermometer i remember this (laughs) because i remember knowing you were in the room and i tried to make a joke for you (laughs) uh and you know what joke i tried to use i'm sure of it you're thinking of fletch yeah, you using a whole oh, hand yeah. there, Doc. <laughs> and I tried so hard. Exactly, I tried so hard to get that out, and I was just, I was too messed up. I was too choked right. up. But I remember I got like half of it out. And, right. Um, but I do remember that, and then them them wheeling me back to do yeah, because I went into surgery right after that. They put me out, but I remember being wheeled out. And the last person, in fact, the last memory I even have before that surgery was looking at Cody because they wheeled me right past him. You know, Cody's just a good old boy. I'd love to have him on the show. I was actually, mm-hmm. ta- we'll talk later. I was just talking to him a couple of days ago. Uh, we'll talk offline, but um, he's he's fine. Um, but, you know, he's one of those like unflappable dudes, right? Mm-hmm. He's just the good old boy from West Virginia. And I remember the look on his face was just like, he just couldn't believe what was going on. 
and I cried. Like I just seeing him like that, just like just like all the emotion came out, and I just remember crying and getting wheeled back. And then, and the next thing I remember is hearing because I'm sure you've been in surgery before. You know how it is. Like when you start coming out of uh, uh, anesthesia, you hear stuff first. Like you you're not looking around. You just start being aware of things going on. And the first thing I remember being aware of is hearing a woman's voice say, well, can I get a picture with him? And I don't even have my eyes open. I know nothing. I'm like, yes. <laughs> I don't know why I know it's for me, but I know it's for me. And I guess it turned out one of the like National Guard Blackhawk crew chiefs was also like Miss Hawaii or wherever the hell they were from. Oh, I kind of like remember that. that. She had like her banner, like her little sash yes. and everything. I and remember. So that. she came over yes. and took a picture with me. I it was weird, mm -hmm. but um, and then yeah, it started the the path to recovery, and then and that's when you guys would come to visit. And it was so funny too because I I know everybody had the best intentions of coming to see me, but I also know that there was an underlying theme to what people wanted. It was Christmas morning, and back then guys didn't have cell phones on deployment. You didn't, you know, the cell phone technology wasn't really the way it is now. So the base was shut down. Nobody could make phone calls until I had a chance to call home. And oh, so that's right. Oh, coming. that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> people were coming to me. And I'm like, hey man, how you doing? I remember Deuce in particular just coming to me like, hey man, how you doing? Yeah. Hey, um, you know, you, you call home yet? <laughs> you yeah. know? Just like, like no, ahead. man, it's like 6 a.m. back home. Like, just give me a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, no, that's funny. Well, at any rate, yeah, I just kind of wanted to bounce that off each other. It doesn't sound like either of us have too crazy of different yeah. memories of it. Um, yeah. but yeah, I interesting. I, I will say the one thing that always stuck with me, and I don't, I don't know if I ever told you the story, not, not that it's anything great, whatever, but that during that whole time, you know, you, all, all the things that we just talked about, you don't really think about what happened. Right. And then obviously when we're in the, the hospital, you, you, you start to think, and it's very real because it's right there. But when it hit me was eventually I, I went back to, you know, they had wheeled the aircraft back and had started doing their stuff, whatever. And one of the, I forget which one of the crew chiefs is like, Hey, he's like, Hey, sir, I don't like, do you just want us to close the log book out for you? Like what, you know, like, you know, cause when you get done flying, we had laptops that you'd log the flight and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I just remember being like, no, no, man, I got it. I don't, I don't want you to like, you know, it's my aircraft. I'll do it. Right. Kind of thing, whatever. And I remember I sat there and for, and I don't know if the software still does it this way, but when you go in and you put your, you know, your flight time, which I did log your flight time for you. Um, uh, it asks you when you hit enter, it says, was this flight okay? Like a box pops up. It says, was this flight okay? And that's when I went, son of a bitch. Like, and then everything started to unravel. Like that happened, that happened, that happened, that happened. And I was like, no, you know, no. and then that's where you would put all your, that's where you would put all your, uh, your faults in, you know? Um, right. So, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, and, and then the day, like a week later, I got my jacket back from the laundry and I was looking at it to see if there was any, any, but they did a pretty good job. They got the stains out, but then I saw the, literally I took a pencil and there was a hole that went in the wrist and it went up and like came out of the elbow, like from really? where, yeah, like where that's so where the bull hole in the collective was, it went in the jacket for probably about that far and came out oh shit yeah wow yeah i didn't know that yeah i i didn't give it back to cif i kept it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that well that's that brings a funny story yeah i knew you logged it because somebody wrote it in my paper log book because remember mm -hmm. we used to keep the paper log book i it was either you or forest i think it was forest mm -hmm. who logged it for me and we logged an hour even i'm pretty sure we didn't fly that, that exactly hour, but yeah. th that's okay we just rounded up Absolutely. um but in the notes remember we had like a note section and he just wrote, ouch. <laughs> an exclamation mark. So, but I knew that the flight was logged and that's what's important. And I think he gave me PIC time for that. So that was good. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, the other cool thing, um, I should have taken a picture so I could post it up. Um, behind me is a little shadow box. In fact, I'll see if I can move uh, that my wife actually made. But it's got our team photo. But if you remember, you were flying flags that day. Yes. Mm-hmm. We used to fly those flags around in the box and you had four or five of them, I think, just stacked up behind me on one of the, the, the avionics boxes and they got shot up. 
and you sent me one. So I was home, I don't know, a couple months at some point, and I get a package from you from Iraq, and it's one of these. And I don't know if I ever told you this. I don't know. Maybe you knew, maybe you didn't, but I knew you knew it had a bullet hole in it. There was a hole in the flag, and shrapnel literally fell out of the box oh, really? when I opened it. <laughs> yeah, it goes like, oh, <laughs> like pieces of metal came out. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was pretty cool um, mm. as well. But yeah, CIF, I had... I remember all of my clothes were just soaked in blood, so they they had to get rid of them. But when I tried to clear Fort Bragg, you know, months later, no one had done a flipple, and I, you know, <laughs> I didn't think about it. You know, yeah, exactly. I was literally like two days from leaving, and I was trying to turn stuff in, and they're like, "Well, you, you know, where's this uniform at?" And I'm like, "I mean, it, I, I was shot. It's coated in blood." And the CIF guy, this old crusty, he's like, "We'll just bring it in in a plastic bag." I'm like. No, dude, yeah. like it's gone. Like it was a biohazard. It's been yeah, exactly. burned, you know. Yeah. And that's when everyone realized, like, oh, we never did a flip hole on this guy. Yeah. So, so they jumped through their hoops, and which is a, a field loss or, or a property loss for for mm -hmm. people that know what I'm talking about. Basically, just signing off that I'm not responsible for getting shot. You know, sorry, sorry, I ruined your uniform with my blood. Right. But um, <laughs> yeah, the flip hole. Well, no, that was a good uh, trip down memory lane. Um. Uh, Jake, I, I think you said we have a, a super chat question. Yeah, Tony showed some love, uh, changing the subject a little bit. But thank you, Tony. He's got uh, Casmo. I'm currently going through okay. Street Deceit. Do you have any tips on building a strong packet? I've been watching your channel for a while. Keep up the great work. Uh, man, I, I'm so far removed from things, it's hard to say. Um, as I, I will tell you this. The Army needs pilots. So yes, I, do. I don't know that a strong packet is necessarily what it was maybe 10 years ago mm -hmm. um and matt you 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 could absolutely chime in as well but i would say for me i i think letters recommendation are always a big deal um i don't know if there's a cap on how many you can have what i will say is your I, they used to call it the AFAST. i think it's called the sift now mm. um people ask me all the time about how do you prepare for, or can you even prepare for that i i say yes go find one of those like pre-test or get your hands on a copy of the test for me i went to like the army library this was forever ago right. um and got a copy of it because the questions in there are very strange and if it's the first time you're taking a test is the first right. time you see those questions you will spend time trying to uncode like what the hell you're looking at versus going in there and be like okay i understand the point of this question because they don't give you at least in, in our day in the afas day they didn't give you any time to rec you know it was just here's the section right yeah. um so I don't know, Matt, what, what are you, any thoughts? So Brian's absolutely right. They're pilots. We need them. Um, so I would say, believe it or not, get your basics squared away. Right. So like, look at, look at what number one, the army's physical fitness and like health and, uh, and medical requirements are right. Like, because depending upon whether we need pilots or we're pretty full on pilots, they relax waivers. Like I remember when I first came in, you had to have 2020 eyesight. You couldn't have eye surgery. Like not, you couldn't have corrected or eye surgery. Nothing. Five years later, like you could get LASIK the day before you joined the army. It didn't matter, right? So, <laughs> so number one is make sure you're meeting whatever those medical requirements are, right? So because you don't want to waste your time or give yourself some time to maybe fix something or get it, you know, whatever surgery or treated or whatever. The next is your physical fitness. Believe it or not, a huge uh, portion of people in the military it's the physical fitness that gets them right. So they're, they're, they're healthy, but you know, they they wheeze if they get up and walk 10 feet and go to whatever. Right. So, you know, your physical fitness is pretty important. Right. And you will also, you can use that in a sense to stand out from other people as well. Right. It's a, that's another thing in terms of the actual, so there's, believe it or not, like you're moving closer and closer and closer to the front of the starting line just by doing those things. The next thing is just like Brian said, letters of recommendation. The best way to do it is try to talk to folks that are in the army that know pilots, right? And potentially some senior ones like a W4, or W5, a Lieutenant Colonel, something like that. Try to get an introduction, say, hey, this is what I'm looking to do, things like that. Most oftentimes you'll find that people are happy to make those introductions. They're, they're happy to kind of bring along. Whether or not people write letters of recommendation, it just kind of depends. But for the most part, try to get in touch with some folks, get a little bit of, you know, get a little bit of uh, FaceTime with them, ask them questions. They know you're going to ask for a letter of recommendation. You don't have to worry about that kind of thing. But that's probably one of your best ways to get in and actually get, 
you know, get a little bit of that uh, under your belt. Yeah, and I would go too with the letter of recommendation. And this is true throughout your military career. Nobody's going to write you a letter of recommendation. What you really do is you kind of write your own letter of recommendation. Um, so what I'm getting at is, especially someone you don't really know, don't go at them cold and be like, can you write me a letter? Mm -hmm. If he doesn't really know you very well, it's very difficult to write a letter of recommendation for someone. Um, so what I would do is sort of draft something a little bit. So try and find some examples. You know, again, if you're talking to pilots, maybe you can find a, an example of one or one or two to, to look at and try to fill it out. They may completely change it, but it's always better to go from a starting point or something right. like that. And you'll find that throughout your military career. How many awards do you write for yourself and things like right. that? Um, so, I, so I don't know if we're answering your question because it's it's hard because one, neither of us went to you know high school to flight school. Uh, and it's been a while since we worried about getting into flight school. Right. Um, but yeah, the the the. The, the sort of prevailing winds right now is across the military is that it's short on pilots. So you're as long as, like he said, if you're physically fit, because that is one big thing that the military is dealing with is, is having physically fit dudes and dudettes uh, try to get in. Um, I, I think you'll be okay. So mm -hmm. cool. Uh, was yeah. there another, there's another one. Yeah. Jaybird 3310 says, Colonel P good to see you. It's Sergeant. Oh, what's up, man? What's up? Good to good to hear from you. I've been following your exploits on Facebook. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, okay, so I did want to shift gears because we talked about something very like you know serious and somber, even though we we laughed about it. Um, kind of goofing off, and you brought up a memory. <laughs> I was so mad at you. <laughs> I was so. <laughs> Which, mad at you. which one which one <laughs> which one well, <laughs> the, the main one the one i was really really mad at you but you know it ended fine so yeah so same neighborhood and i want to say this was maybe a month or so before the the shooting mm. we go out at night i'm gonna tell i'm gonna start this story from my end and then you're gonna tell me how it went on your end mm. so we we're at at night we typically flew pretty high we just use the thermals on the site and we just kind of kind of early, early man's UAV, you know, it was, right. a, it was a manned vehicle, but we just kind of circled around and we put the site down and we looked for bad dudes, which generally at night they weren't doing shit anyway, but, but we did it. And so we were out and we were in that bad part of town. I think route drill, if I remember correctly, mm. is the, uh, the route. Oh, this is, I, we, I remember the strangest shit, uh, but route drill and that mosque. And I remember I was right seat lead. You were left seat trail. And, we did kind of a big orbit around that neighborhood. And I, as I was coming around back to the West, the mosque was down at like my 11 o'clock low. I remember looking up again, we're at like a thousand feet and I see you guys kind of coming towards me. And my first thought was why, why the hell are they not behind me? Like what is going on? I go to key the mic to ask what the hell are you guys doing? And that's when I notice the telltale signs of a man pad with a corkscrewing smoke trail mm -hmm. coming from the mosque up to your aircraft. And so I immediately, as I'm keying the mic to say, what are you guys doing? I say, I said, Sam, Sam, break right or something. Mm -hmm. And I pitch it over into like this corkscrewing turn. I got my finger. I've wazed up or well, we didn't call it was back then. I'm now let my Apache stuff show, mm -hmm. but I've selected rockets. I'm ready to just dump rockets into this mosque. What what does it look like from your standpoint? Um, yeah, we, it, pretty much the same. I mean, we were we were, I remember trail. I, I think I remember correctly. It was a fairly boring night, but I do remember that that area had been kind of a hotbed. And this is a little bit later in the deployment too. I, well, yeah, we were yeah maybe like three, four, five months in kind of thing. And uh, yeah, I just remember uh, for some reason it would be like a great idea to drop a smoke grenade uh, down into like the the courtyard of the of the area, right? Just a, just as a bit of a like, you know, we're you know we're watching you guys kind of thing, and, and yeah. maybe a little we're bit unhappy of, with you. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right. I mean, you know, um, and you know, add into that a little bit of boredom, add to, you know, whatever kind of thing. Um, me not thinking, you know, we were trail, so I didn't even expect you to see it. You know what I mean? Like it was, you know, so, um, and I, I forget who I was flying with, but I just, I just, we were just like, 
Yeah, this seems like a great you idea. You were with Cody. You and were with right. Cody because yeah. I was with Boots. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I just remember this seems like a great. Yeah, this is a great idea. It's a great idea. Let's go ahead and do it. So, um, you know, you know, did it and didn't even think, you know, that first of all, you'd even see it, right? Um, but then, yeah, I do remember hearing like Sam, Sam, break, break, and I think I don't know if me and Cody laughing came over the radio or not, but it was. <laughs> It did. <laughs> this yep. was very confusing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. That yeah. was. Cool. Yeah. I remember you were pretty well, hot. I, think, I was like, Ooh, sorry. Ooh, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I think what you told me later after I came down off of my anger fit, because I was scared, uh, um, was that you had thrown it and it popped like almost immediately. Like normally yep. there's a delay. And I remember you saying something like you threw it and it popped and it was just like spinning Mm -hmm. and that you looked at it and said, man, that looks just like a, and it like clicked in your head and you went to go key the mic. And right as you were reaching, suddenly I'm yelling. (laughs) That's right. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Cause normally if you, if you timed it right, it wouldn't, you know, the smoke wouldn't pop until it hit the ground or, you know, whatever. We got pretty good. Every KW guy got really good at throwing smoke grenades. And, uh, and I just (laughs) remember being like it, you know, by the time it just got past the skid, the, you know, the, and I was like, Ooh, yeah. (laughs) And so we're halfway through our corkscrew and I'm like, you know, I'm like doing this number of trying to look for you guys as I'm diving back in my, my, I mean, literally my thumb, I've lifted the cover on the switch. I'm ready to just start dumping rockets. And I see you guys still just hanging out there. And so in my mind, the missile has missed you guys, but you don't recognize what's happened. Like maybe it was a pop, no kick on the radio, something, you know, I don't know what's going on. And so I call back and I remember being like, Hey, Sam launch. And Cody calls back and you could hear the laughter. And he's like, no, that was going down or something (laughs) like that. And so here we are in this like corkscrewing dive. And I just look at boots and he looks at me and we're like, what did he say? And so Boots just like keys the mic. He's like, say again. And I don't remember what you guys said, but it made us realize what had happened. And I mean, my, you know, my heart is pounding out of my chest, you know, thinking everything that's about to happen. And I, I pull out of the dive and I think I said something like, you know, get in trail, call Eagle, you know, and, and you guys said something, I probably cause it didn't understand me. And I just looked at Boots. I was like, fucking tell them, tell them to follow us. I'm not talking to them anymore. <laughs> so, and so I turned back to the airfield. I was like, I'm done. I'm done with this flight. And I just flew back to the airfield and you guys tucked in and nobody said a word. I think yeah. we called tower. We landed. We got out of the aircraft. We post flight and we did a lot. Nobody said a word to anybody. I went back to the CP and I was just sitting there like, like, cause we had that one computer in the mm-hmm. command post. Yeah, and I was like on stuff. it. I was like, yeah. I don't check an email or something. And I, you know, you guys were like, everybody's coming in, like shuffling stuff around and putting their rifles away and stuff, and nobody's saying a word. And finally, I just turned around in my chair and I just looked at Cody, I think was in the room. Maybe you were too. And I was like, do you know how fucking scared I was? And then everybody just started to laugh. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was wild. Cause I was, I thought it was game on. I thought in, we were in hindsight, on. in hindsight, probably, uh, <laughs> probably should have announced it or something. Yeah, exactly. Or maybe not done it at all. Yeah. But yeah. Mm-hmm. No, it was fun. Yeah. The, the other memory I had that I wanted to share with you, cause I bet you don't remember this one. Uh, this is absolute pure professionalism. Jake, mm. uh, can you bring up water bunker? Mm. Yep. I'm on it. absolute professionalism consummate there we go (laughs) just yeah consummate professionals so there i am off to the left looking god looking way young and there you are in our water bunker that we had created one night i think we had weather that night and we couldn't fly and we were on like the crazy ass late shift yeah like midnight Um, or something yeah and we did then we just did this and i remember the enlisted guys who worked in the cp or the the talk were just so like just disappointed in us you know you can just see it in your face like because they're always bringing in the water jugs and here are the dumb pilots down there just playing around um i think there's a couple couple more yeah there we go so so there's i think boots he's the the safety officer yeah that's our safety officer he's the enemy 
<laughs> as he declared, because that's what the enemy looks like is the black uh, silhouette. We're all pointing weapons at each other. Yeah. Uh, probably not armed. I think that's you and me in the bunker. I think so. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else. There's me and Cody. Yep. I'm clearly giving some some directions about right. fire discipline. And, I mean, just look at look at the intensity on Cody. Like, look at him. Oh, you know what I mean? Like, stone cold killer. He sees beyond. You know, absolutely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's you and me. Yep. Establishing establishing security. That's right. Uh, just just tax your tax dollars at work, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. There it is the, right there. The stuff you do when you're bored. Um, you know, if it wasn't that or what, dudes, like I think back then, like video, like Guitar Hero was huge. Like back then, like yeah. or it had just come out, and like that's it was it was either making bunkers out of water bottles or playing Guitar Hero. That's like what people did in their spare time. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't a lot to do. I remember one day, I think it was still pretty warm because the flies were everywhere, mm -hmm. and we just made like a competition of how many flies we could kill. Mm -hmm. I remember being like 60, 80 something. Cause the flies over there are dumb. They just let you kill them. It's not like in the States where they're zipping around. They just sit there and like, oh, I guess I'll die. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it was a good, it was a fun deployment for the little bit that I, that I made it. Um, but no deployment since then has had that level of, of craziness. Um, mm -hmm. There's been some other interesting times, but neither here nor there. I guess the last thing I want to talk, you kind of change gears again, kind of fast forward. So you spent most of your time like me flying Kiowas. Mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually you went on to fly Apaches after the Kiowas divested. Um, what was that like for you to go into the Apache? Like, what was it like the first time you got in the Apache and flew that versus what you were used to with the Kiowa? I mean, it was pretty way different, right? I mean, just walking up to it, you know, I had gone from a bulk of my career of not, frankly, not caring about the Apache, right? Because most, right. not all, but a lot of Apache guys were like, ooh, the Kiowa, whatever, you know, kind of thing. And so our thing was, you know, we had done some teaming in the past that worked out really well, but I had never really cared, frankly, about the Apache that very, that much, right? Um, so when I, you know, hey, you're going to the AQC and you're going to go fly it. I mean, just walking up to it, obviously, very, very, very different. It's, you know, this big big 20,000 pound machine kind of thing. I, I do remember flying. It was, I remember the first time you actually get in and, and uh, down at, well now Fort Novacell, you know, when you actually go to fly it for the first time with your IP, no more simulator, no more anything. And I do remember being pretty, pretty badass, man, of just, you know, being able to pull in an armpit of power and it, it being there and just how you kind of sat up, you know, especially that back seat, you really are on top of everything. You see everything you're, you know, you're really, are in control of everything. So, I mean, I, I liked it as an aircraft to fly. I mean, it, it was cool. The thing I liked about it was, you know, the Kiowa was a great aircraft and it always will be, you know, probably first and, and specials to my heart, but that was a purist aircraft. I mean, it was, you know, had almost no systems. Right. You had to, you had to fight the aircraft, right. To get anything you wanted out of it. And anything that was on, it was just kind of an afterthought strapped onto it. The machine gun, the sight. The, I mean, everything was really just kind of strapped on. Whereas the Apache is, you know, it's made to do what it does, right? And so I like that about it, right? I mean, as you know, shooting with it was, I don't want to say easy, but just, you know, um, oh, you can tell this was actually made to do this. It's made for two pilots to talk to one another, all that kind of stuff. So I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I enjoyed it. Um especially flying and others a great flying aircraft uh i did you know take every opportunity because i was a, a lieutenant colonel when i went through aqc before i went to go take command of uh, 66 cav and so i could get away with being a little bit more lippy than like a w1 going through the aqc <laughs> so i made sure that all of the uh i made sure that uh all of the IPs knew every one of the shortcomings that I thought the aircraft had. And, you know, especially <laughs> comparing it to the Kiowa, right. Um, you know, yeah. I got to go seven pages deep just to get to the FM and blah, 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 you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, but it was, I, I liked it. It was a challenge. And again, just like go all the way back to when I was a Lieutenant in flight school, right. Like I better be pretty good at this cause I'm going to be a guy in charge at some point, I guess. And so when I was going through the AQC, I knew my next stop was to be a squadron commander. So I should probably be pretty good at this thing, right? I mean, I need to be, you know, I, I never believed in the commander flies with the safety officer. I, I never believed the commander flies with the SP. 
Um, it's just a weak mindset, to be honest with you, um, for folks, uh, because the commander's too busy, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's no, you should be the pilot command. It should be you, your SP, your safety officer, and like your senior maintenance test pilot are like the most experienced people. So go out and do it. So there's a fair amount of, sh of stress, but it was a fun course. I enjoyed flying and I enjoyed learning about it and definitely shooting. I mean, shooting was pretty badass in that thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You, you said the same things that I thought about getting in the first time and just thinking like, this is purpose built. That was like the first thing that struck me. It was like, this is made to do the things that I'm asking it to do versus the Kiowa, which I loved. It was a fun aircraft, but yeah, it was a lot of kind of aftermarket thought type, you know, it was like, here's a helicopter. Now let's put a bunch of shit on it and make it yeah. do army stuff uh, versus the, the, the Apache shooting. It was easy in the sense that, yeah, it was designed to do those things. At the same time, I felt like it was work, you know, like because there were so many various ways to do the same thing versus the Kaya was just like, well, I guess I'm going to point at the whatever and I'm going <laughs> to push this button and everything's going to come out. Right. And um, I remember going through gunnery phase, you know, and that course was so long. I think it was too long. You know, yeah. I don't know about your experience, but when I went through, it was me, two other Americans and 11 Saudis. So like right. we were stuck in the Saudi class. And so it was designed for these kids who hadn't flown a helicopter in like two years anyway, because they'd finished like, you know, rotary wing initial entry in Australia two years prior or something. Yeah. And so now you've got these experienced dudes who already know how to fly. They stick them into a patch. And that course was just painfully long. And by the time you get to gunner, you're just like, dude, I just want to go home. Like I've been here for five months, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And I remember my instructor pilot giving me a hard time. I mean, he was a Kiowa guy too before. And he, you know, he's like, sir, you get worse at this every day. I was like, dude, I'm just tired. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like all this pushing buttons just to shoot rockets. I'm used to just flipping yeah. a switch, pointing, pushing a button and then making things go away. Now I got to worry about where my head's looking and where you're looking and all this crap, you know. Um, but at the same time, once you figure that stuff out, uh, yeah, it's, it's very much made to do what you want to do. We grew up with a very... Um, there was a divide right between the Kiowa and the Apache guys. I don't think it was terrible. I think it used to be probably worse than it was. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it was terrible, but it was definitely there. There was a lot of ribbing that would sometimes go maybe a little bit too far, but you know, generally we all got along, but did as a squadron commander, how did that, like how many guys did you have in your squadron that were retreads from the 58 world? Did you have quite a few or just, just a, oh, a, a ton, a ton. Um, and I actually, I banned that word in my squadron. Um, I, I chastised <laughs> my SP publicly uh, for that. Um, um, partially for culture, partially just, you know, cause we would do that to each other. But um, cause I also let him knew every shortcoming of the Apache that I thought was his personal fault. Um, but uh, no. So I, so fairly, I know other squadrons did it. We weren't by any means unique, but uh, basically I, I went to Fort Drum take 66 Cav. They were currently in Korea on the rotation, on that nine month rotation that the Cav squadrons did as a Kiowa unit, right? So they had turned in their Kiowas, gone to Korea, used the prepo fleet that was there for them, and then effectively were coming back to PCS to a transition or ETS. Like that was it. So morale was fairly, as you could expect, kind of low. I mean, cause it was guys that didn't want to see the Kiowa go guys and girls didn't want to see the, the Kiowa go. You had some people that were like just finished their RL progression and now they're coming back and like, now what do I do? Right. Um, and back then, I don't know how it is now, but it was, you know, the, the Apache and the, uh, it seemed they either went Blackhawks or, or I'm sorry, Apaches or Chinooks. Very few of them went Blackhawks. Yeah. Um, I don't really know why um, or UAS. Some of them just said, Hey, screw it. I'm just going to go, you know, they kind of see the future thing. And, uh, but anyway, so I, I took command on a Thursday, Friday, I gave everybody off. And then we got our fleet of aircraft from five national guard units, right? Cause that was ARI mm -hmm. and the guard was giving up their Apaches. So basically I had my SP who had never been in a job outside of a company as a W4 um, because he was just a really good IP. So they just kept him in the company and that was it. Oh no, my S3, my S3 was an Apache guy. Other than that, literally like the little nucleus that I fell in on okay. no one. And then we started, uh, building basically a, a, a troop capability at a time that was kind of set in motion before I got there, but it, it made sense, um, to build capability one at a time. And we would get, you know, I remember, you know, I took command in July, July. 
and you know by december we were able to shoot one troop gunnery you know at that point because it was just you had to get people in and progress them and then you know come october november and fort drum the weather you know goes downhill so uh but yeah it was uh, the i would say probably 60 40 60 percent being either guys you know kiowa folks that went to become apache guys um or brand new out of flight school and were apache folks so you know luckily i had some really good ips and really good maintenance folks um that you know they bought into my culture because i remember the thing i briefed our brigade commander was he he sat us all the battalion commanders down like a month in and he says what are you going to do with your two years and i told him i said i'm i'm not worried about gunnery stats i'm not worried about whatever i said we got to build a we got to keep the cav uh, culture going with all these purebred attack guys coming in right. and yeah. with a fair amount of like disgruntled kiowa folks as well right so that's yeah. that's pretty much what i that, that was pretty much my mission for uh, for taking over yeah, that was an interesting time because, like you said, not only were you changing aircraft, um, you were changing that culture because you were reflagging attack battalions to cav squadrons mm -hmm. or, or you know things like that. But I thought it went pretty well considering I think a lot of us as Kyle guys were expecting to just be kind of just stuck out to pasture. Um, even if we did make the transition, you're just like, okay, put baby in the corner. Mm -hmm. um, I I saw like a great mixing of the two cultures mm -hmm. um i was very fortunate in the squadron that i ended up in as a major uh being put on the atp for one of the troops the the um, training plan so essentially for staff guys for those listening it's if you're a staff guy you don't belong to one of the companies of the troops but they will take you in on their what's called an atp and so that's you fly your flight hours comes from them and your training and stuff like that but the ATP that I fell under was a lot of Kiowa guys. It was like it was like where they stuck all the Kiowa dudes for the squadron, it seemed like. Um, but even a lot of the Apache guys were like totally open to learning new stuff, mm -hmm. you know, from that culture. And I've had a lot say like it was a really good thing for the Apache community to get some of those Kiowa guys, which I just never expected to, to hear right. that, you know, mm -hmm. to hear those words. Um, but it was a difficult time. And I remember talking to an Air Force guy. They had the same issue with um the osprey coming online and guys who flew mh-53s you know the music stops and there's only so many chairs mm -hmm. um and the military is too big to comb through and be like okay well, let's find the best kiowa guys and the worst apache guys we're gonna swap them it's like it doesn't work right. that way like if yeah. you're dead last apache guy you're the stupidest dude the window licker you're staying because you're already qualified to be apache right. guy mm -hmm. it's gonna be it's going to be cutthroat of the Kiowa guys to see who mm -hmm. makes that transition. And yeah. And some guys ended up in Chinook. Some guys wanted Chinook. Some guys, I mean, I would have taken anything, you know, when, yeah. it, when my number was up, I, I told branch, I was like, I'll fly whatever you want me to fly. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but yeah, I think it ended well. We'll see how the future holds with the new aircraft once they figure out yeah. what that's going to look like and, you know, UAVs and all this madness. But um, well, cool. Well, I think, we've been going for quite a while uh and i appreciate your patience with that um okay. i didn't know how long this would go and um so i think we'll just start wrapping it up here but i do want to say again thanks for for doing this um i would love to have you back on and just do like a bullshit session with you know people listening and letting them ask questions and stuff like that and um yeah, absolutely we'll just talk about whatever so well cool all right well, I think we will wrap it up there then. I know um, we've had a decent amount of people watching. I think we're sitting at like 94 right now. Um, so like I said at the beginning, if you asked a question, it wasn't really the kind of the focus of this one because it's more like a back and forth interview type thing. Um, but as we just said, uh, hopefully soon Matt and I will get back together and we'll just get on here. We'll just grab a couple beers mm -hmm. and we'll just uh, bullshit and let people ask questions and things like that because otherwise it just kind of breaks up the flow. So... Jake, I think uh, I think we're ready to shut it down. If you're ready, yeah, let's do it. Matt, thanks for coming. All right, no, absolutely. Yeah, hey, thanks, thanks again, man. Matt, love, thank you. Love doing it. Yeah, absolutely. It was great. I'm glad that I'm glad that you could make it. And uh, thanks everybody for watching. And we'll uh, we'll talk to you next time. <laughs>